Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me better now. Uh, we are going to be doing a webinar about the uh, new features in Booth 3. This will be more of a general overview of all the different features and just a step-by-step -step of how to. We'll do some more in-detail examples of all these things later on. But for now, we're going to try to hit all of these features, and there's a bunch in uh, just about 45 minutes or an hour. So to begin with, we're going to start about hashtag printing. With hashtag printing in version 2, we harvested images from hashtags from Instagram to go in a uh, slideshow, but it wasn't possible to print those. So now we've added the option to browse those in a kiosk and allow people to print. So here's how you would set that up. First of all, you want to go to Global Settings and you want to authorize an Instagram account. You need to have an Instagram account of some kind activated and authorized so that the images can be harvested and you have access to the servers for Instagram. Then you want to go to the Slideshow tab. All of the controls for this are done in the Slideshow tab for harvesting images. And you want to just choose Custom and Enable Slideshow. All the top section is for the actual slideshow from photos taken in the booth, but all the way down at the bottom right here you'll see a checkbox that says Generate an Extra Slideshow. So you want to choose that and uh, then you want to go down to display social media images and then choose Instagram. Now over here on the right you'll see an edit button and here's where you'd put your information in. Now I've chosen to use the Dallas Cowboys and I put in uh, just my hashtag Dallas Cowboys. You don't put the tic-tac-toe sign, don't put that in there at all. That could uh, cause some problems but just leave that out and just put Dallas Cowboys. Now then you've got an opportunity to choose a timestamp so if you're doing an event, uh, you probably want to put uh, recent or today because you don't want images that may have been with another event using that same hashtag way back. You don't want to do that. Another feature that is in part of this is it, everything is formatted to print as a 4x6. There's no size selection or anything right now. It's just a 4x6. And then we allow you to choose and create a template. So in this bottom thing down here, if you click Choose, you open the template selection and you can choose a template that you've pre-created. We'll talk about that in a minute about how to create that template, but I'm going to choose that one right there. So I'll go to the editor in a few moments and show you how I created that template. So we're going to choose that template and click OK. Now all you got to do is click preview and that starts the process. What that does is let the software know start harvesting. So click preview and then you can exit back out of that then you can go to manage and open slideshow and you will look right here these are all the files that make up the slideshow but if you see this folder right here called social 2 you click on that now you see all the images that have already been harvested since I started this and if I click on one you'll see that uh, it is a uh, it's formatted it's got the photo of the person that posted it and their profile name and any comment that they made about that a particular photo okay so you can see that so those are images that was harvested from how uh, uh, from uh, Instagram so now I'm going to close that window and show you how the guest can see that so we're going to go if you go to the global settings section under booth control you'll see the IP addresses that you would use to access those images just like you would with the kiosk so in the kiosk we're going to go um, over here and choose a kiosk and I'm going to pull it up so you can see how that works. Give me just a second to get that pulled up over here off screen and then I'll move it on screen. So here's how that would look from the kiosk. Okay so you can make that full screen on your iPad or your tablet or whatever you're using but you can go through and you can select an image just like you would with the social kiosk. They can browse from image to image and they can email it, text it, or print it. Now in the case of Instagram harvesting you probably ne wouldn't necessarily want to do email or text but you could. You can turn those off if you don't want them. The most common thing would be printing. So this would allow people to go to a kiosk, browse through the images, and find one and print it and email and text it. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Now then, I'm going to back out of that and we're going to go back over here and I'm going to show you that template and how that works. 
So let's go to the main tab and choose our template editor. And in the template editor, here's the template that I created. So here's a couple of things, and all this information in detail is in our uh, booth manual. But if you look here, I've just created a template with a background, and I put Instagram on it and some you know little graphics and stuff to flower it up. But right here, I've added a graphic object like I would any other thing, but I've added a, a tag right here. You can see percent XML colon user icon percent. So putting that in there will pull the harvested uh, user profile photo from that Instagram account and display it right there. The same thing applies here with a uh, text tag, XML colon username. And then down here I have XML colon message. And all of those things will cause the software to pull that information from Instagram and insert it in that template. And so that's how that works. And all that's in Booth Manual. If you don't have time to write that all down, you can look at it later. Okay? So that is how Instagram harvesting works, and people can go through and select images from there. Now then, let's talk just on to the move of the next one. Um, post videos and, and uh, gifts to Facebook. What we did is Facebook does not allow actual GIF. GIF is a file format. It's, it's a .gif, and it's an animation that animates simple frames. And we've all done GIFs in 2.5 with Darkroom, but now we've uh, added the ability to convert those to MP4 so they can be posted directly to Facebook. So if you choose post to Facebook or post user post to Facebook, then those GIFs, animated GIFs, get converted to an MP4 that Facebook will accept directly. You don't have to do anything, just choose those, and if you do a GIF in Facebook, it does that for you and converts those to MP4. Uh, really soon, we are working on an option to make all GIF output convert to MP4 so that they can be text and then posted to Facebook. So that's coming really soon. Uh, but right now, the Facebook post and the user post. The difference between these two, in case you don't understand, is the post to Facebook, you, spit, you pick out a specific Facebook page that you want to post to and then put in your username and, and password for that page. Um, it could be a business page, it could be an event, whatever you want to do, and those images get posted to that same page. Uh, with the Facebook user post, it prompts the user for their username and password and it posts to their Facebook page. So you can choose one or both um, and, and do that that way. All right, the next feature we're gonna talk about is print signing. Print signing is very simple to set up. First of all, you go into the template editor and you choose your template and you define a signature area. Now, the way you define the signature area, and I'm just going to delete that one so that I can start over, but the way you define the signature area is you click down here in the bottom icon that says signature. If you're using it on a vertical screen and all the icons don't display, there'll be a new menu up at the top called add that you click on and scroll down and choose signature or you can right click and choose add and choose signature so there's three different ways you can access that um, but let's just choose one so then it brings up this reticle here or this uh, dialog box here and uh, you can choose the pin color the pin width the opacity that's how whether it's transparent or not in most cases you're going to want hundred percent um, you can choose a background color if you want and a background opacity that would make the signature in a white box or something like that but if you just want to overlay the signature over the top of whatever's underneath it you would choose a background opacity of zero okay so then you get this box right here now you can choose where you want that box you can position it anything any way you like and then when the uh, session is run it will prompt them for their signature and they can insert their, you know, type in their signature in a box. It presents a box on screen and they can sign, you know, with their finger or something on the screen. And if you want to use a pen, you could, like with a Surface Pro, you could use the pen. And it would insert that signature in that color and pen size in that box. So you define the area you want the signature to be. Now, once you do that, you exit out of that and choose that as your template and then you simply go to the text 
tab and come down to photo signature and check that. You can change the text of how you want it to look to the customer and from there they can just uh, sign their name. So let's take a second and take a look at one of those and see how that works. So I'm going to run just a quick session here. Don't have a printer selected. Whoops. Hold on one second. Let me make a couple of changes here. Okay. I didn't choose a screen. There we go. Yeah, this is all live, folks. <laughs> so you're bound to have some uh, things that didn't I didn't have preset up just right. Okay, I'm going to turn the slideshow off so I'm not constantly being in that. Okay, now, here we go. So here's our screen. We start the session. Uh, we're going to do a photo here. And I've just got it set up for one photo, so it's only going to take one and not fill in all that. But there's our signing. So I can sign my name. I'm using the mouse here, but you can also do it with uh, your finger on a touch screen. You can choose clear and go back and do it over. Or you can choose OK. And then when you choose OK, it goes on with the session and finishes it. And then we'll go back over here and you can see um, where I signed my name. Now you can adjust the pen width and the color and all the different things that you want to use there. So those are all adjustable. So that's print signing. OK. Now I'm going to go back and turn that off so that we can go on to the next feature in the text tab. And I'm going to uncheck that. OK. Now then, the next feature we're going to talk about is type a note. The difference between print signing and type a note. You still define an area, you choose a font, it's text, and you type it on the screen. So we're going to show you how that works too. So first of all, let's make a, uh, let's take a template. This is the same template single photo that I was using a while ago, but without the signature spot. So in this particular case, I'm going to choose uh, a text box. And in the text box, you can insert special text, other, photo note, okay? And add that. Now, I can choose the font and the style and the color, whatever I want that font to be. Uh, that's completely up to you, and whatever font is on your computer is, is something that you can certainly use. Uh, you can also choose alignment, color. You know, if I wanted to make it uh, red, we could do that, all of those things. So anyway, there's where it puts your, uh, your, your box. Now you want to increase the size of your box so that you have some areas to type and uh, give them plenty of room to type in whatever their note's going to be. So that's where the note area is going to be. And let's save that template. And we're going to select that template as our default template. Then once we save it as our default template, we're going to go over to the text tab and check the box for photo note. Then you can also insert um, whatever text you want to display when they do that. So I'm going to choose and go. And then now when we run a session, you'll see that it pops up and prompts me to type a note. Okay. So it's prompting me to type a note. Now I can use my on-screen keyboard or I can use a physical keyboard, whichever one you prefer. So let's type a note. Okay, so there's our note. I just hit enter. It continues on, finishes out the session, and gets ready for the next session. Now then, if we exit out of there and go over to the prints, you'll see 
that I have a note typed on the photo uh, in the color and size that I chose and position. Everybody got that? So that is type a note feature and you can use that for a variety of things. All right, let's go back and see what our next one is. Uh, Multi-monitor support. Multi-monitor support um, is a great feature that does a lot of really cool things if you have multiple monitors, things that you can do and various things with different ways. So let's show you how to set that up. First of all, you want to go to the Screens tab and click Edit. Now this is our standard, uh, one of our sample screens, and you can see that it is the width and shape of a standard 1920 by 1080 monitor. Now that would uh, allow you to arrange controls or previews or whatever you wanted anywhere on the screen. But if you have more than one monitor, let's say that you have a laptop and maybe another monitor facing the customer and you want to be able to, one to, to start the software and control the software or if you have a, a booth with a front screen and a back screen or several different options like that you could set it up to where you are in control of that so here's how that would work first of all you go to edit screen and you can see here that we have extend to multiple displays okay I'm going to back up just a little bit, point that out again. Edit screen is, is where you control the size of the screen, the page color, and so on. So you click on that icon down there, and then you want to choose extended display. And then you can, if you just have like two, for instance, you can choose combine all area of monitors. Now I have three monitors, so I'm not going to do that. But in this case, you could choose custom, and you could choose whatever size you want that template to be. Now the monitors that I have, and your, your mileage may vary, but the monitors that I have are 1920 by 1080. So let's say that I'm going to use two of those monitors. And so in that particular case, my resolution would be 3840 um, in the width. So I'm going to type in 3840. That's 1920 times 2. And then the height is not going to change. So that's going to be uh, 1080. Okay, so that's the display size I want it to be, and that'll spread over two monitors. You can still choose the background color and all those things just like always, but watch what happens when I, when I select OK. Now suddenly that screen is as wide as two monitors. Now I can drag and move anything I want anywhere. So let's say I want the previews to appear on this second monitor over here, and instead of uh, that I want it to be a two by two sort of arrangement. So let's go with two by two. All right, so there we have a two by two arrangement. Now I can resize those to fill that monitor. And so there, in that particular case, my live view would be on one monitor, countdown on one monitor, and all the controls on one monitor. And then my previews would show up on another monitor. So you can imagine if you had a big screen TV or something above the, uh, the booth showing the big you know, previews however big you wanted them to be. Or you could do your live view on one and your controls on another. You just select whatever elements you want to be on that uh, particular monitor. And you can spread that out a wide variety of ways. They could be one monitor above another. It could be side by side. They could be monitors that are back to back, like if you wanted to, as I said, put all your control buttons on one monitor, uh, laptop monitor facing you that you use to control the booth while they just see the live view and the previews on the other monitor. So you can play with that and do a lot of different things, a lot of creative things. Imagine, for example, you wanted to have uh, a smaller touch screen that people did all the signing and typing and things on, and then you wanted to have a big screen TV with the live view and the preview on. You could do that. And here's how the next feature I wanted to talk about that goes along with multi-monitor, and that is the ability to move and add the keyboard and the prompts. To different places. So I'm going to transition right into that and show you how you do that. Uh, just like I mentioned uh, the add, you can also do input. Okay, choose input. You can right click and choose add and choose input or you can just click on the icon in the bottom if, it, uh, if you have a horizontal monitor. So let's choose input. Now you really don't need to set any of the other options, you just click OK and it puts this little reticle on the screen. So that's where your keyboard and other prompts would show up. So if you're going to do uh, you know, something where you want the uh, 
the keyboard to show up on a second monitor, where they sign to show up on a different monitor, or if you're doing a vertical screen, you want the keyboard and everything to be at the top. Then you can just drag that wherever you want it. That would put it at the top. This would put it at the bottom where the standard is. If I wanted to appear on this monitor, I could just drag it over there. So anywhere you put that, you could put it in the middle and it would split it between two monitors, but you wouldn't want to do that. So you could put it out anywhere you want. This, this is a popular request for people that have vertical screens because the, the people would have to get down really low to try to use the, the uh, keyboard if it was down really low. But now you can move it to the top of the screen so that they have a more convenient place to do it. You could also move it to a second monitor. So you can just drag that reticle anywhere you want, and that's where your keyboard and your other prompts for signing and things like that would show up. All right, does that make sense to everybody? Okay, I'm going to save that. And we're going to uh, move on just a little bit to the next feature so we can stay on task here. The next thing I want to talk about is indirect support for, um, for uh, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. Now, those don't allow us to post directly to their servers. That's just a policy they have, and we don't want to try to hack in and violate that policy. We want to work nice and play well with other companies like we would expect them to do with us. So we're not going to violate their policies. But what we've done is we've added the ability so that you can put an icon for Instagram, Snapchat, or Twitter on your screen where people can choose that. And they can put in either their phone number or their email address and have a photo sent to them already formatted for that size screen if you wanted to do a special template that was made for Instagram or something that was square, something like that, you could do that. Then um, down here on the main screen, you'll see right here, post to Twitter, post to Instagram, post to Snapchat. You check those and it just automatically appears as another icon in addition to email and text and so on. So here's how that would work. Let's choose post to Instagram. You have all the normal things, but you can choose to either send by the email address or by the, uh, the phone number. You just choose whichever one you prefer. You can choose the size, add a template, so you can format that just for that particular thing. You can also choose an animation if you wanted to do that. But up here in the message, if you choose that, it's got some basic instructions and a link that would allow them to load it by clicking on that link to Instagram and be able to post that that way. So it just makes it a little more convenient. It is not a direct post to Instagram uh, or Snapchat or, or uh, Twitter, but it does make it a little bit more convenient for people to be able to do that and just uh, a little simpler and easier. So basically they're texting or emailing the phone to themselves and then they are uh, or the photo to themselves and then they're able to post that to Instagram, Twitter, or Snapchat themselves. But this does make it a little simpler and easier. So you just check the box, set up any parameters and you could make a special template just for that if you wanted to. Okay, uh, next thing I want to talk about is support for custom booth lock screens. Now Darkroom um, 2.5 had the, uh, the custom or had the lock screens where you could just on your phone using booth control you could select a screen uh, hit booth lock and it would show you know be right back that kind of thing but we added in the latest version the ability to um, post that and, and put in your own lock screens so what I'm gonna do here is I want to take just a second to set that up real quickly give me one second to change to a different screen so you can see how this works okay so there's that and then I'm gonna go over here okay here's go here we go now what you'll do is in your booth control screen so this is what booth control looks like you're gonna pull up booth control and if you scroll all the way down you'll see there's the maintenance lock like it was before but now you have a custom lock okay now when you choose custom lock there's a folder in the darkroom programs folder that you can add a JPEG a GIF or a mp4 video file you would probably want to use a short one but you can add whatever files you want and when you choose that custom lock then you see them displayed here on your phone or tablet and you can scroll through all the ones you have available and you can choose one and then that would be displayed in place so I'm going to pull this aside and I'm going to choose this one and I'm going to go into booth mode so you'll see how that works. 
So there's our booth mode screen. So now when I choose, you'll see that it goes to the booth lock. And then I can unlock it as well. So choose custom lock and I can choose whichever one I want and it goes right to booth lock. Now you can still use the, the maintenance lock or the, uh, the standard, you know, that we had before. Those are still available. The be right temporary, everybody will be back, back kind of thing. Uh, but you can now add a custom of your own so you can put a video or something in there like that. All right. And it's real simple. You just create your own. I would create them in whatever format that your, uh, your screen is going to be. 1920 by 1080, etc., and that would allow you just to uh, choose one and, and do that. We also added support for payment acceptors. Now that's a very, you know, popular request for people who want to build a stationary booth that's built in somewhere, and it's uh, it's really pretty simple to to do. You go to the controls tab. Uh, what a payment acceptor is? Let me back up a little bit. Payment acceptors would be like a bill acceptor or a coin acceptor or a credit card. Now, the thing about that is, is Darkroom has been able to use a bill acceptor before, but if you put in, let's say you had it set, you wanted it to be $5 for a booth session. If someone put in a $20 bill, well then they got their booth session, but you got their $20 bill and they didn't get any change and they didn't get anything else for it. With booth accepting now, what it does is it tracks those credits. So if they put in a $5 bill or a $10 bill, they would have a certain number of credits then you set the number of credits required to start the session. So if they put in a $10 bill and it was set to five, then they could do it twice. And it would tell them, okay, you've used five of your 10 credits and go from there. So here's how that works. First of all, you choose the required number of credits to start. And then in the setup, you would have to have a fidget connected to your bill acceptor. And so when you click setup, it asks you to put in a fidget and it takes you to the fidget. So you would add your input. I don't have a fidget connected, but choose your fidget and then set it to start after five credits. And so that would just be the number of credits required to start. And then it'll also, you can display text on the screen that says, you know, you need two more credits. If they just put in a $1 bill, you've got to put in four more credits, etc. So that's how that works. It just tracks the credits that they put in. Next feature we're going to talk about is the photo booth, uh, photo booth book feature. That is a new feature that was added in 3.0 and it is in the wrap up tab. It's very simple right now to do and it's just a checkbox to do. We plan to add more features in the future so you can create a template and you know design the page any way you'd like. But right now you check generate photo booth and there's the options. I don't have a path so I'm just going to choose one and we'll just choose the desktop. Okay so it's trying to do that right now but there's no options or anything what it does you just tell it where to save it it takes all of the photo strips from your session from that event so if you got 100 200 300 however many strips are in the event and then it takes all of those and it uh, formats them in an 8 by 10 page and puts about four to six on a page depending on how many you have and then prints that to a PDF multi-page. So it would just be all the sessions. So before you do that, you'd want to go back to your prints tab and remove any orphans. Okay, An orphan would be like test files where you were testing the booth and getting everything running and going. You'd want to remove any orphans so you only have the ones you actually want to print and then just go here and choose generate a photo book. And so it would just put out that photo book. It's very simple. It's just an 8 by 10 page white with the photos on it so right now. But we will be adding the ability to add a template later on so that you can expand on that. Um, I'm going to skip down to the next few things here. Uh, we also added support, a built-in driver for the new DMP 620 and 820 printers. So if you come to the printing options, add, you'll see that we also now have an 820 and a 620 printer. If you have one of these printers, there's a new firmware that allows the uh, 820 and the 620 to do panoramic prints. And this is revolutionary when it comes to a die sub. A die sub printer like the DMP620 and most printers that are used in the photo booth world, they have 
ink panels that are specific lengths. So a 4x6 media kit has an ink panel big enough to do a 4x6. You can't do a 6x8. If you get a 6x8 media panel or a media kit, then you do that size. 5x7 is the same way. So you get a specific media kit for the specific size you want to print. But with the new 620 firmware, it overlaps 6x8 panels to produce a longer panoramic print. So you use 6x8 media. This won't work with 4x6. It works with 6x8. And so in the software, we're going to add that one. And then under print sizes, you'll see that we have new sizes, not just 6x8, but 6x14, 6x16, 6x20, and 6x24. What that does is it takes that 6x8 ink panel and it fades them together and overlaps them and does a absolutely beautiful job where you can't really even tell and it would allow you to print up to a 6x24 pano or long monster strip from your your uh, printer and that's a really cool feature to be able to do that so this is it's very simple to set up you just choose the size you want to allow in this screen right here and then you go back over to the main tab create your template choose other and come to 6 inch and choose whatever size you want the template to be so that's really all there is. It's very simple to choose. And then Darkroom supports that printer directly. So using 6x8 media, you can now do uh, 6x14, 6x18, 6x20, a lot of different sizes there within the software. Works the same way with the 820 if you have one of those to make it 8x24, 8x32, etc. So lots of options there. So that's a great option if you have that. You can use that feature with the um, alternate print so that you could choose you know a regular 4x6 uh, get two of those or you could choose a monster strip and get a monster strip so that that works great for that printer um, so that's that's two features basically the 62820 driver built in and also the panoramic print from those so those are all included I want to talk just a little bit now about the panoramic and VR Facebook posting Okay, so Facebook has a feature where with, with photos formulated a certain way, when you post them to Facebook, they go on as a panoramic where you can scroll around and they follow the, the phone as you move it around. So we've added that ability into Darkroom Booth 3, so you just have to format a specific size template, and then once you do that template, you, uh, you just post that to Facebook and Facebook does the rest. We add the appropriate tags and things for that. So here's how that works. I'm going to move this over in here. This is a page from our booth manual. And you can see right here, to do a pano, you want the template size to be 5,000 pixels by 2,300 pixels. That's a Facebook requirement, and Darkroom adds the appropriate tags for that size. If you want to do a VR360, you want to use it 6,000 by 3,000. And in that situation, you would, for the VR, you'd use this you know, a 360 photo in that as the background. Works great with green screen and allows people to be inserted into an environment. Uh, we'll be doing more information about that. But then you add that template in the Facebook post. So you go to your Facebook post in the main section, main tab, and you choose what page and everything you want to post it to. And then you put in the border that you're going to be doing posting and Darkroom does the rest. That's all you have to do is, is put that border on uh, in that Facebook post area and Darkroom will put it on Facebook and make it work. Okay. Um, another feature that we added is the include survey results and output prints and digital social. So how that works is you set up in the, um, the text tab and enable your survey and let's just choose a survey here. Let's go with car. Okay, so under question one, what you would do is in here, you've got your question and everything, and then you see this text right here, use response to set template named field. Okay, so you could call this field current car or whatever. And then in your template, you create wherever you want that information to go, you would put in the uh, the tag percent current car percent 
So you decide those field names. It could be name, it could be address, it could be anything, depending on what you want to do. So you could use this to make a photo ID where people type in their information and it's inserted into a, um, a template. Um, you could do a lot of different things, but you just, you just enclose that field name that you gave it in parentheses, not parentheses, I'm sorry, percent signs. So it would be percent, field name, and then percent again. Now, in this case, it would insert this information here. You could also have it a text response, whatever response you have in the template. And you can do this a couple of different ways. One is with a full-blown survey, and then one is where it just prompts you for the, the information and inserts it. The difference between that is with the prompting for information, then Darkroom doesn't store that information. It only just prompts and puts it in the template. But if you do it in the survey section, then it actually stores that information in a database file that you can export later. So if you were doing a corporate event and you wanted to be able to offer that information to that corporate customer, you could do that and allow them to, to purchase that information from you. But that's the difference between just prompting for the, uh, the text to go in the template and doing a survey. But you can use either one. So you put that in your template and it would insert that information. Now if you wanted to have Darkroom um, that. If you want to have Darkroom just prompt for information but not store that, then instead of choosing a, uh, a survey, you would take that out and not, not have a survey in there and just choose automatically generate survey from print template. So in that case, you would put in percent uh, sign name percent, percent sign phone number percent percent sign, whatever you want it to prompt for, and Darkroom's going to use that between the percents to prompt them. So it says, please enter your name, please enter your phone number, etc. And then in the template, Darkroom would insert that information in whatever text and font you wanted. So you could use that to create a lot of different things, a baseball card where people insert their information. Um, you could create a, uh, an ID badge, I said earlier, where they get their picture taken, insert all their information, and it prints out an ID badge. A lot of different things you could do with that. Uh, the next feature I want to talk about with Darkroom Booth 3 is custom template for Facebook user posts. Touched on that just a little bit, but a new feature in version 3 is if you're using the user post, we allow you now to put a, a separate border in here. If you leave it blank, the default is they would get the same template that is printed out. So whatever template you set for the, the primary template, they would get that one. But in version 3 that you can choose a separate one. So if you wanted something different to get posted to Facebook that has uh, you know, a different background or a different format, square instead of rectangle or photo strip size, you can just choose a different template here. So that's a new feature in Booth 3. Uh, next we're going to talk about um, the uh, Boomerang GIF feature. Uh, there's two different types of GIF that are capable in, in Booth 3. And GIF is used to be a specific file format that had a .gif uh, animation, but it's kind of become sort of a, you know, a, a anything that's animated has become called a GIF. And so with Darkroom you can do um, two different types of, of animations. One of those is where we take still photos, just a normal session like you would print out, it takes still photos at timed interfaces or intervals and then takes those still photos and puts them together in a GIF and you can put different templates, you can make the templates animate, you can use green screen backgrounds, you can do a lot of different things and do some pretty crazy unique stuff with that, that standard template. And so here's how the, the boomerang works in that now. So you choose regard, you know, whatever your output style, you know, if you wanted to send it to Facebook or email or text or whatever. So let's just choose the text. And if you check Enable Animations and then Settings, in version 2.5 to do a boomerang where it played forward and backward, you had to add multiple templates and add them forward and backward. So you'd have template 1, template 2, template 3, template 4, and then backwards, 3, 2, 1. Now all you have to do is check a box. So there's a little check box right there. And then if you don't even want to add any templates, if I didn't do anything more than what I've just done, just checked Enable Animations and Enable Boomerang, then what I would get if I did a four photo session, I would get just four photos that would go one, two, three, four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, three, two, one, and it would just play those over and over. 
You can change the delay between frames. A, uh, a smaller delay number there would go faster. So you can play with that and get whatever results you want there. But uh, the, the standard GIF is what we call this, and that was available in 2.5. But now, instead of having to add multiple templates backwards, you just simply check a box to get that boomerang effect. Okay? Um, I'm going to close that out. And talked about keyboard placement. Print Doodle. Let's talk about Print Doodle. Okay? Print Doodle is similar to signing. Here's the difference between Print Doodling and signing. With signing, you define the uh, location and area that you want them to sign. And they see a box on the screen that they sign in and then that appears in that location. They can only write a small amount in that defined location. So whatever, wherever you decided it's going to go. But with the, the new print and the way that is with print doodling, the way that is turned on is in text. I'm going to disable some of this. You just check this box right here for print doodle. And it's gonna you can change the text that you want displayed to the customer. But with print doodle, let me run a session here. With print doodle, it will go through. I've only got it set to take one photo right now, so we're just gonna do one. And then it will present me with the finished photo that I see on screen. And I can use my finger or a mouse or whatever, and I can, you know draw a circle around it. I could clear it and go back. I want to draw a heart around it. Now you can decide the color and all that, but draw a heart around it. You could, you know, draw arrows. You can draw whatever you want on that screen and come down here and write your name. So the difference between signing and print doodle is signing gives you a box that's defined and they can only write in that box and they can only, that only inserts in a defined area. With print doodling, it shows you a preview of the photo, and they can draw anywhere on the photo. And then when they click OK, then it's going to print that and save that. Uh, so I'm going to go back over here. Now you can see all the information on the photo I did. So that's print doodling. So you know you can choose whichever one you prefer. The print doodling is very easy to set up. You just check a box. You don't have to do anything else. And uh, it lets them draw anywhere on that particular photo. So that's uh, that's a pretty handy feature with print doodling. All right, keyboard and other placement we've already talked about. I want to talk about uh, three things left that we haven't touched on. One of those is burst mode boomerang. I touched on regular GIF a while ago. The difference between a burst mode boomerang and a regular GIF is burst mode is a video. We take a short little video clip, usually three or four seconds. You don't want to get you know too long with that. You want to do it just a little short video. And then that video is taken and chopped up in a certain way, depending on your settings. And those settings are right here under this video tab. Okay, so you choose right there. So you set the recording time and let's say well, let's go with like four seconds or three seconds or something. Then you can change the capture rate. That's how many frames are taken from the video. So if you're you know, just recording a video, that's 30 sec frames a second. That's just going to pull 10 frames a second out of it. You can change that to vary the effect. You can also vary the playback speed. So it could be faster, slower, just depending on what you want to do. And you can vary the maximum uh, width and height. You want to keep that relatively small. If you get very big, the file gets very large, and it's you know, it's going to be difficult to text or send that anywhere. Uh, so you want to keep that relatively small. You can also add a template. Now, one of the cool things is you can add um, green screen templates to this, and we drop it out in the video. So they can do a green screen. You can add an overlay so that it's on top of it. There's a lot of different things you can do there. And I'm going to show you one real quickly here. This was one that was done, um, it was a green screen, and it was done at Photo Booth Expo. This was just, uh, we had a booth there and people would come up and do it, but that's just a little sample. It's a green screen dropout, so you can see the green screen is dropping out really good. They were in front of a green screen, and that's just, uh, her hair is flipping around and it's just dropping out like that. Okay, so that's a burst mode GIF. Now you can also do that, uh, you know, if you choose the burst mode GIF, you can text it, you can email it, you can post it to Facebook, etc. Um, as I mentioned earlier, 
it's currently if you text or email it's a, it's a GIF file that won't allow them to later post to Facebook but we're working to change that really soon so all output can be selected as an mp4 that can be posted later and um, I got one more feature auto cropping and auto head placement these features are new and they are somewhat uh, still kind of in the works uh, let's do with this template right here okay so um, in your photo node that's this right here where the number one is or something in the photo node you'll notice down toward the bottom there's a new checkbox that says auto size faces fit all faces within the outer image rectangle so if I choose that option then I get this this circle and you can move that around you can resize the rectangle and what it will do is however many people are in that rectangle it resizes them to fit within the space so that you know the idea is if you've got a, a big group followed by a smaller group by a bigger group it will appropriately digitally zoom in or out to fill the space and uh, you can play with that and see how well you want to do that you can move that in and up and down and decide how you want. It's not supposed to crop off any faces. What I would recommend is create two identical templates. Set one to normal and one to the auto head placement and the auto cropping and, and see the results. You can run a session. It'll show you both templates. You can see what the results difference are. And so that'll, uh, that'll be a fun thing to do. The other thing that you can do is the match one face move faces and scale closest to the rectangle. So the purpose for that would be if you needed to fit a face into a specific place in size. So for example, let's say that you uh, were doing a template. Um, you've all been to fairs, I'm sure, where they had a one of those big cutouts that had a hole that you stuck your face through so it looked like you were a clown or maybe at the museum or something it looked like you had your face in a space suit or something like that. Well, if you did that, that and sized this to whatever size you want the head to be and put it wherever you want it to be then it would move the head to that location and put it in there. Now those the kind of things you'd want to do with a green screen. That's what that's for because it's going to drop everything else out and just put the head in the right spot. So that would be a great thing for doing something like that if you're doing something that you want to do that with. Um, another application for the auto sizing would be, I mentioned earlier, the uh, the photo ID. So if you had, for instance, you wanted it to be a specific size and in a certain place and all that kind of stuff, then you could um, you could do that and it would resize their head to fit in that spot and they wouldn't have to worry about making sure they were too small or too big. So those are some things that you can do with the auto head placement and auto cropping. Uh, let me just kind of go back down my list real fast and make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, I think I got everything that we have included in version 3 currently and I hope everybody enjoyed that and understood it all. We're going to be continuously adding new features into Darkroom 3. We've got it's an ever evolving thing and we've already got a new uh, version that will be coming out very soon with a few fixes and, and a couple of new things. So stay tuned and uh, stay current and if you have any questions or anything you can let us know. We will also be doing a um, uh, some more in-depth uh, and more detailed uh, webinars in the future on these various things. If, uh, if anybody has any questions, you can always contact our Darkroom support staff uh, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 Central Time. That's 1-800-517-4522. If you have any questions, let us know. Hope you had a great day, and uh, happy boothing.